Last week I said there's a whole lot of crushing going on. Does anybody feel like they're being crushed? Does anybody feel like they're being pressed? Does anybody feel like there's ought and hardship all around? I do, but I don't want you to be discouraged. What I want you to do is I want you to see how Jesus handled the crushing. I want you to see how Jesus handled the pressing. I want you to see what his response was. And I want you to see that from that place comes a beautiful fragrant offering. I said last week, never trust or follow somebody that hasn't been through some real difficult, hard times and overcome, or a man that walks with a limp that's wrestled with God. All of us in one way or another are being shaken. We're all being shaken because God loves you enough to not leave you the same. So I'm going to keep it real simple for you. There are strange things seeming to be going on everywhere around. But if your eyes are on the Lord, even when you don't know what to do, God will give you an answer. You just keep your eyes on him. That's what Jehoshaphat did. When he was outnumbered by a massive army, multiple armies coming, to get, coming against him, he said, I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. And sometimes you're going to come to the place where you don't know what to do. Sometimes you're going to come to the place where, man, I don't know how much more crushing and pressing I can handle. But if you understand what comes from the crushing and the pressing, if you understand that God loves you enough to not leave you the same, if you keep your eyes on him, if you learn how to pray, and if you follow Jesus's example, I promise you, you're going to come out smelling really, really good. You may not smell good when you're being burned. Burnt stones probably don't smell good, but they smell good to the Lord. And God uses burnt stones to build. God, remember last week we talked about how when Nehemiah was going to rebuild the wall and the temple, Sanballat came, which means strength of the enemy, and he taunted them and he said, will you build with these burnt stones? Will you build with stones pulled out of the trash? You're feeble little Jews. You're never going to be able to do this. And he literally was cursing Nehemiah and the Israelites. But the answer was, yes, God actually would use burnt stones. And he would use stones pulled out of the rubbish. So even when the enemy taunts you and he says that you're not worth anything or you're never going to measure up or your life's not going to amount to something or you're going through a hard time, what you need to understand is that in the midst of that, God will turn it and use it and build something out of you or create something out of you really beautiful. In order for incense to rise before the Lord, the prayer of the saints, it has to come from a place of authenticity and crushing. So we talked about last week. So today we get to talk about another type of crushing, the oil press. We talked about incense last week. Today we get to talk about what it's like to turn into beautiful extra virgin olive oil. Crushed and cold pressed, not tainted by religion, understanding who the Lord is and understanding what it means that when you're in agony, you pray even more earnestly and more fervently, no matter what you're going through. And so I want to start off by reading Luke chapter 22, 39 through 46. This is Jesus praying in the garden just before he heads to really his darkest hour of his life, the crucifixion. Luke chapter 22, verse 39 through 46. Coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives as he was accustomed. And his disciples also followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw. And he knelt down and prayed saying, father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then a sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. When he rose up from prayer and had come to his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. Then he said to them, why do you sleep? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. Now in Matthew chapter 26, it says that Jesus was deeply distressed and exceedingly sorrowful unto death. Greatly distressed and exceedingly sorrowful unto death. So I want to start off by going back to verse 39. 
says that Jesus went to the mountain, the Mount of Olives, which was less than a mile from Jerusalem, as he was accustomed. The word accustomed is really important because it literally means that Jesus had a spot that he went to a lot. Every one of us should have a spot. Now, it's hard for us at our house because we have little kids. And if the kids know that you're home, they don't give you a break or a second or they're loud. They just, they don't like you being there and not giving them attention. So we have our spots. I have a lot of spots. I have different spots. And every time I go to pray or to go spend time with the Lord, I actually ask the Lord, Lord, Where's our spot? Where do you want to meet? Anytime you're going to meet with somebody, you typically say, where do you want to meet? Where are we going to go for lunch? You want to meet at the coffee shop, my office? So I know that when I'm going to spend time with the Lord, I have a place that I want to meet him. And I have a lot of different places that I like to go. I have a couple spots off Laguna Shores. I have a turnaround under Flower Bluff on the bridge right here at the turnaround. Sometimes I like to go over the bridge and I'll go sit under the bridge on the other side on the island by the water. Other times I'll go down off Ocean Drive. Sometimes I'll go walk to the back of my property where I can get away. When kids aren't home, I like to sit at our table and look out our picture window to the back. I'm always wanting to know where the right spot is for me to have an encounter with the Lord. Jesus actually had something to say about spots. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 6, he said, when you pray, go into your room. Now, if you study this word room, it literally means a storehouse or an inner secret place that's a storage closet. It means the place where you get your supplies. It can also be a dispensary where you keep your medicine, or it can be a place where food is distributed. It's an inner, it was an inner place inside of the home that was a a hidden secret spot where there would be supplies. Or it could also be your closet where you have your clothes or your covering. And it doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be one of those places. The premise is find a place where you can get away alone with the Lord and commune with him. And I'm going to tell you that God is into spots. So find one and don't be haphazard with it. Sometimes your best spot's going to be in your car on your lunch break. Whatever it is, make that place a place of communion wherever you go. And so When we go into the secret place or into the secret chamber, that's where we get our supplies from the Lord. That's where we get our provision from the Lord. And Jesus' secret place was often on a mountain and he was accustomed to going there. The word accustomed means this is our custom. It's a custom. A custom is a a consistent, constant cultural practice, or in Jesus's time, it was a prescribed practice like a liturgy. So he knew when he was going to spend time with the Lord, where he would go. He made it his custom and he made it a a part of his everyday life. And my challenge to you is, is if you don't make it your custom and you don't make it a part of your everyday life, you'll be haphazard with it. What you can't do is just live as a workaholic. You can't just get up thinking how I'm going to hustle and grind all day, or I have to hustle and grind all day. You get up early, you go to bed late, you'll eat your bread with sorrow. The main thing has to be the main thing. And Jesus kept the main thing, the main thing, which was consistent and constant communion with the Lord. It was his custom. Next is where did Jesus go? He went to the Mount of Olives and he went to a garden. This garden in Matthew 26, verse 36, Matthew tells us that the name of that garden is Gethsemane. Gethsemane. The word Gethsemane means olive press, olive press. It's two words. The very first word of the word olive press or Gethsemane is the word Gath. Gath was also the name of one of five royal Philistine cities and specifically the name of the city where Goliath came from, Gath. The word gath in the Old Testament also means the same thing, wine press. Why am I telling you that? It was in this place of the wine press where it seems that the enemy is coming against you consistently and you seem overwhelmed in your darkest hour and the power of darkness would be present that God will produce something so beautiful out of you. It's in the garden. It's in this place of gath that God actually uses 
the enemy to produce life in you. And I know that can sound strange. Like how could the enemy ever produce life in me? Well, let's talk about oil press. The first thing that happens to an olive tree is it has to, the olives have to either be plucked or in the old days, they would take a big stick and they would literally beat the tree. Jesus would take our beating. And as the tree was being beat, they would have a blanket on the ground and the olives would fall to the ground or they would pluck it by hand. Today in olive orchards, they have a big giant machine that literally rolls over the trees and violently shakes the tree and all the olives come off the tree onto a conveyor belt. That's how big olive orchards will do it now. But what I want you to know is that in your most difficult, hardest season of your life, whether it's persecution from the enemy because of your faith, or if you inadvertently or purposely put yourself in a situation where the enemy seems to be beating you, if you'll respond right and cry out to the Lord, something will come out of you that will be beautiful and useful. That's why you never give up. That's why no matter what, I don't care where you've been or what you've done, you never stop pursuing the things of God. Don't listen to the religious lies that would try to keep you back. And so here's Jesus in Gethsemane. Gath was the place that David two times ran to when he was running from Saul. David would run purposely to the enemy's territory to hide out from Saul and even one time agreed to be a mercenary for the Philistines against his own people. Thank God that the Lord intervened and kept him back. I don't know what would have happened. This is a story in the Bible where David was going to partner with the enemy to go fight God's people. And it was the enemy that said, we can't let this guy go or he'll turn on us. Maybe David would if we don't know. But what I do know is many times we either run to the enemy's camp or many times the enemy's coming against us and there's crazy swirly stuff happening all around. But if we respond right, like Jesus did in the garden, something beautiful will come out of us. Now this word gath, which means wine press or to be pressed is related to a musical word which means to be beat, plucked, or twanged. Beat, plucked, or twanged. It's like beating a drum. The more that you beat a drum or pluck a string on a guitar, what happens? A vibration comes out of you. It produces a sound. It produces a song. It produces a melody. The most powerful messages I've ever preached or heard the greatest worship songs I've ever heard have come from the depths of the heart of a broken, humble person that's crying out to God with authenticity, not trying to please man, not trying to uh, uh, be the latest, greatest, most popular, but somebody that's broken and desperate. What you have to understand is brokenness and desperation is beautiful to the Lord. He doesn't despise it, Psalm 51 verse 17. But brokenness without contrition is nothing but brokenness. Isaiah 66 talks about worship from a broken place, but having no contrition. So I'm broken, but God doesn't want to just leave you broken. Contrition is, I'm sorry. Contrition is repentance. If you don't bring contrition to your brokenness, you're just broken. Without contrition, there's no healing. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So many people will walk in here broken. Some of you may feel very broken right now, but if you can see that the brokenness will produce something beautiful out of you, either beautiful olive oil or a beautiful fragrance, you'll look to the Lord and get your eyes on him and you'll be encouraged and find hope in the midst of it. So now, no matter what comes our way, it may hurt though my outward man may perish. On the inside, there's hope and encouragement because I trust God and I know what's coming out of me. I know that God's producing something beautiful out of me, a sound, a song, a melody. That's why you have to understand the altar of incense. Once a year, the high priest would anoint the four horns of this golden altar in the inner court as an atonement on other people's behalf. And so now what we realize is that literally God is breaking you for a greater purpose. And many times it's for other people.
Let me just show you a quick picture. Pull up the picture of the press, not the press, the, the gr millstone. This is what an olive, pre olive grinder looked like. This wasn't the press. This is the olive crusher. And what would happen is you put the olives inside this big giant millstone, and a lot of times it'd be a person or, or what's called a beast of burden. A mule or a donkey would hook onto the wood and just walk, circles, 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 crushing the olives, crushing the, the pits or the seeds, and anything else, any leaves or whatever would be in there. It would all get crushed into a paste right here. And then go to the press. Then that paste would be laid between these fibrous reed, not really, they're like filters, not paper, but like filters. And they would stack them on top of each other. And then a giant stone, or throughout time, you would have a big mechanical press, or today you'd have a hydraulic press, would crush all of the paste through these fibrous reed papers or filters, and the oil and water would ooze out. And then that oil and water would have to be separated because the water over time would taint the pure oil. If it's cold pressed with no chemicals, you get what's called extra virgin olive oil. Extra virgin olive oil. It can be filtered or unfiltered. We actually like unfiltered. And did you know that about 80% of olive oil sold on the shelves today is fake? Do your research. If you're buying cheap olive oil, it's usually fake. Anything 10 bucks and under is usually not the real deal. Pure olive oil is expensive. It takes time. There's a lot to it, especially for high quality olive oil. So now I want you to imagine your life with a millstone over and over. And God just keeps crushing, crushing, crushing. And somehow in the midst of it, the enemy has this little way in, in it, even though he's defeated now. You know the scripture that Psalm said, even the little foxes spoil the vine. But the Lord says, my vine, I am way bigger than that fox. The fox is defeated. So don't let the fox spoil your vine in the midst of the crushing. I get it. The enemy can work his way in, but stop blaming the devil when really it's the Lord taking you to the Mount of Olives, to the oil press, and then to the cross so that a resurrection can come. This is a constant process in our life. You know why this is a constant process? Because God loves you and doesn't leave you the same. Now, this isn't the most popular message that grows really big churches, but it's the message we need to hear because God has this way of crushing out any impurities and bringing out the most beautiful extra virgin olive oil or crushing the frankincense and the binders and the fillers to create a beautiful incense and fragrant offering before him. That comes from a place of brokenness. This is why brokenness and contrition are the sacrifices of God. He doesn't despise that. He wants pure, beautiful, broken, crushed people that aren't living for themselves anymore and have nothing to lose. Because when you come to the place of have nothing to lose, you stop defending and protecting your stuff, your life, and living in fear and worry about all the things. There's no more fear and worry. Does anybody want to come to that place? Be careful raising your hand. Because with it comes a whole lot of crushing. But out of the crushing comes a whole lot of smoking. Meaning a fragrant incense, right? We're not smoking, we're smoking. All right. Anyway, last service, we had a young adult here. He came and said, you don't know how much this message meant to me. He said, you spoke exactly what I needed to hear. And then he drew this picture. Do you have that picture? You can't really overly see it, but no pain, no gain. There's a man in a press. What I want you to really understand here is the more that you shake the more that the enemy beats and shakes, the more crushing that you get, the better you sound, the better you smell, and the more harmony comes out of you. However it comes, shaking, beating, plucking, pulling, twisting. The key is to stop purposely putting yourself in the spot. Be obedient to the Lord and let God see Jesus didn't sin, and yet here he was in the garden in agony being crushed 
in the garden of Gethsemane. And somehow the Lord was allowing the enemy to play a part of it. Because you guys should know the story. As Jesus is crying out, he says to the disciples two times, pray that you don't enter into temptation. Two times. Once before, he says to them when they get up on the mountain, pray you don't enter into temptation because you don't know what's about to happen. You don't know what's about to come. But he knew that what was about to come was going to be the power of darkness on another level. So Jesus is in sorrow, he's distressed. And that same darkness and pain that Jesus was facing and that was all around in the atmosphere was affecting the disciples. And he knew it. And he said, pray that you don't enter into temptation. So then Jesus goes and falls on his knees or we often see a picture of him on a rock praying, weeping tears of blood. However it was, he went about a stone's throw away. And in your darkest, most difficult hour, I want to assure you, Jesus is never far. He's never far, beloved. Please, let's stop coming to pre-conclusions of what we think things are and blaming things on the enemy and thinking that Jesus has forsaken you or that he's left you because he promised he'd never leave you or forsake you. And then I said, thank you, God, that you gave this to show me and to show us how in our darkest, most difficult times, we can cry out like you did. He said, well, I did it to show you, but I didn't really just do it to show you. I did it for you so that you wouldn't have to. Because he took the pain. He took the cross. He did what you couldn't do. And even in our darkest moment, it pales in comparison to what he faced. Nobody's resisted bl uh, uh, sin unto bloodshed, the Bible says. So why would Jesus tell the disciples two times? So he gets up, he comes back, and he finds them asleep from sorrow. Why would Jesus tell them twice, don't fall, uh, pray that you don't enter into temptation? What was the temptation? Well, I believe there were three temptations here for the, for the disciples from the enemy. Number one, depression, anxiety, and sorrow. Number two, to fall asleep or quit or give up in the midst of it. Number three, take vengeance on my enemy and matters into my own hand. Doesn't that sound like so much of our lives and so many people that we know, and maybe you're going through those things. You know, one thing I can tell you is that when I'm facing my most difficult time, whether it's sickness or adversity or hardship, or I'm overwhelmed with responsibility, so many times all I want to do is sleep. Am I the only one? Aren't there times you're just like, I just, all I want to do is just lay down and sleep it away. Or I'm so full of sorrow that I can't even pray. Look, there's a reason why Jesus said twice, pray that you don't fall into temptation because the temptation will be to not pray. The temptation will be to quit. The temptation will be to retreat. The temptation will be there's so much sorrow around me. I, all I want to do is sleep. Or when the enemy shows up, I'm going to cut his right ear off and I'm going to take matters into my own hand. Because as soon as they showed up, all the disciples said, should we draw our swords and kill them? That was the greatest temptation. Things are so difficult, so hard. I'm being so crushed. I've got to figure out a way. I've got to take matters into my own hands. Or we play the blame game. It's your fault or their fault or the devil's fault. And here's Jesus praying in agony. And what did he pray? Go to verse uh, 42. Please, God, Father, if there's any possible way, is there any way, Lord, please? Take this cup from me. Nevertheless, it's not my will. God has this way of bringing you to a place where you say, God, whatever it is you want, I want. It's not your will. It's his will. And the ultimate place of crushing in the oil press brings you to a place where you say, Lord, it's your will. You know how long the stone would sit on those fibrous reeds of filters? A long time. I don't know why the, I don't know why we're going through something for so long. Why does the battle seem so hard? But you know what I do know is God's producing something out of you. And the more broken you become, the more beautiful you are. What if the adversary was being used like a pawn for your advancement? What if the enemy was the key to your advancement? We don't like to hear that. 
But we could say, well, then why is there a devil? I mean, I wish you could just live. Let's just say, man, I, I would love to make you a promise that you'll never, ever, ever go through the oil press and be pressed and crushed and agony and struggles and hardship. And I can't try to pretend or make your story into something it's not or my story. All I can tell you is we're all going to have a story. Build your story. And don't complain. Look at the next verse, 43. The more that Jesus would cry out to God, there was an answer from heaven. See, I see Jesus making an altar of incense in, on the mountain. When he fell down, he was making an altar of incense. Jesus became a sacrifice before he was a sacrifice. He was broken, a living sacrifice, crushed, crying out to God. And in turn, God would send help from on high. Remember that angel with the censer that's catching your prayers up there and turning, flipping the bowls and sending it back down? What if God had an angel assigned to you? In fact, the Bible says that there are angels. I'll show you that. But look at this next verse in verse 44. The more agony he was, he quit. No, it doesn't say that. The more agony he was, he complained. No, it didn't say that. The harder it was, he cursed his enemies. I mean, I'm sorry for the hardship, but I'm not sorry. It hurts, I understand. I wish that our own brothers and sisters wouldn't turn against us. I wish that our friends wouldn't be sleeping when I really needed them to be praying. I wish in our marriages, we were more united to intercede and fight for one another. But here's what I know. Being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. <laughs> and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly while the angel came and strengthened him. Psalm 91, 11. The angel of the Lord encompasses or he'll give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. I don't see angels in person unless I've met a stranger that's an angel. The Bible says to always, always pay attention to anyone and everyone around you because even by entertaining strangers, you've entertained angels. It's very possible you've met or an angel before that tested you. That's why never be mean, rude, nasty, and always be obedient to the Lord. I don't take care of every person standing on the street corner, and I don't personally hand out money on street corners. If I feel led, I'll go buy them food or water. There have been times I've given somebody some money, but it's very, very rare. Instead, I'll go buy them food because I don't want them to take my money and go buy a 40, and I'm just feeding their addiction. But even sometimes, if the Lord says, do it, I'll do it. But more often than not, I'll get them food. But the main thing is, don't be mean and disrespectful because you never know who that person really is. Now there are seers in this room. There are people that can see angels. I don't understand it. They say, I see angels. I saw an angel behind you, or I can see the angels standing around, or people have seen them on the big giant angels on the street corner. They have a gift to see. I don't have that gift or I haven't, that gift's not manifested in my life, but I can sense and feel them. And I know what the Bible says, Psalm 104 verse four makes it very clear. Again, there's so many scriptures about angels that talk about how God gives angels as ministering flames of fire, his servants here to serve you and care for you. In Luke chapter one, Zechariah's got picked. The lot fell to him to go burn the incense from the tribe of Levi. Zechariah is actually Mary's uncle. So kind of like Jesus's uncle, really. And so here's Zechariah at the temple. And he's the one in charge to burn the incense. And while he's burning incense, the Bible says an angel named Gabriel shows up and announces Jesus. The key is to burn. The key is to be pressed. The key is to become pure virgin olive oil. That's the outcome. On the other side of every death is a resurrection. 
Jesus was sorrowful even unto the point of death. He felt like he was going to going to die. And I don't believe any of you are going to die. I don't believe that. And I'm going to fight all the way to the and even if you die on earth, you're going to live eternally. We have to get past the place where we're where we live with the fear of death. It's bondage. And the key is is no matter how much agony that you're in, you keep praying. You know what this word agony means? It means to wrestle one-on-one. It's hand-to-hand combat. It means to be a gymnast. I was a state champion wrestler, so I know a little bit about wrestling. When I step on the mat, there's no team. It's just me and my adversary. And there's a wrestle that every single one of you have to go through that's just you and your, and your adversary. But what if really God was in the midst of it to produce something out of you? Or it's to be like a gymnast. You may be part of the gymnastics team, but when you get out on that horse or beam or bars or floor routine. It's just you and you alone. The root word of agony is the word of go. It means to be led into battle. See, we know the old ABC song or theme for the wide world of sports, the agony of defeat. But what if it was the agony of victory? What if Jesus had a purpose and a plan in the midst of your hardest time, and instead of you retreating or falling into temptation, you prayed more earnestly and you trusted God, and you stayed rested in the midst of it? See, here Jesus would cry out. So apparently there is some sort of condition where people can sweat blood. There's also being in so much agony that when you're crying out, you bust capillaries in your eyes. I busted all my capillaries in my eyes once before when I was having a horrible anaphylactic shock, my body shut down and fought to breathe and I busted all the capillaries in my eyes. It's really not about the drops of blood. It was more about how much agony he was in and contention and contending he was in. It's contending for a promise. It's contending against an enemy and it's never giving up no matter how hard your situation is because God has got you under that rock What if he was the rock? What if he was producing something beautiful out of you? When he was in agony, he prayed more earnestly. I would encourage you to not wait for agony, but to contend now. I would encourage you no matter what you're going through, live a lifestyle of crying out. I would encourage you no matter what, stay accustomed to the secret place. I would encourage you that it may be hell all around you, but your response is it as well. I would encourage you to find your places, get into position, make, make it a prescribed consistent system in your life. I would encourage you to Always seek the face of the Lord and not despise the crushing. I would encourage you to allow yourself to become pure virgin olive oil or a beautiful, sweet smelling fragrance before the Lord. And for anybody here today that's watching or sitting here, that's going through a hard time. You feel like you're in the olive press. Does anybody feel like that? Anybody then let's stand together and pray. Um, pull up this scripture. I know you may have pulled up Luke one ten. I really like this. It says that the multitude was praying outside at the hour of incense. It's the hour of incense. It's the hour of incense now. I don't know why God does what he does here and with us, but he does. I know that this church has gone through a lot of pressing and it is being pressed. Hardship, difficulty, adversity. And this church is amazing. I love my church. I love this house. I love everybody here. I would come to this church if I wasn't the pastor. This would be my home church. But if you're going to go after the more of the Lord and you really want to be transformed, there's going to be a whole lot of crushing. And what I would encourage you to do is don't despise it. Don't despise it. However, the olives need to come off the tree and into the anvil and into the press and into the jars and the separation of the oil and water, 
the whole process is a picture of our lives. But today, if you're going through something really hard, we want to pray for you. If you're not going through something hard, we want to pray for you. We're going to pray. This is a church of prayer. And the harder it gets, I know this is a word for some, may not be a word for everybody, but I know it's a word for some. There's a whole lot of shaking going on. And I know it hurts. I know it hurts. But let it happen. What if you could just lay back and let the press just crush out the oil? We didn't kick and complain and fight and scream, tear each other down. You're not a victim. You're not a victim. Sonship and victimhood can't cohabitate. Just feel the Lord on that. You're not a victim. God loves you enough. He loves you enough. Just close your eyes for a moment. Lord, I pray for everyone watching online or listening to the sound of my voice and everyone here today. Lord, in the midst of the darkest hour, in the midst of the pressing and the crushing, there's a garden. There's an angel multitudes of angels. There's a song coming out of us, a sound, a vibration, a shaking and a crushing, a fragrant offering. Make us a fragrant offering. Just say that to the Lord in your heart. Make me a fragrant offering, Lord. Make me the purest of olive oil. Help us to see the oil, Lord. Help us to see the vapor instead of the crushing and the pressing. Help us to know in the midst of the crushing and the pressing what's coming out of us, Lord. A mighty army. Help us to see that even the adversary will bring us to our advancement. Gethsemane. Gethsemane, a beautiful place. And yet a place where darkness came. I pray healing over you. So let the Lord heal your heart right now. As you're listening or driving, walking, working, or sitting, wherever you are. Fresh oil. The oil of the Spirit. A resurrection on the other side. It's a resurrection. Comfort, Lord, send your angels. Every teardrop, Lord. <sighs> Forgive us for self preserving ourselves, Lord. Forgive us for adding religious chemicals to the process of the cold press trying to get out from under the stone. We can't make ourselves. We can only allow ourselves to be broken. 
sacrifices of the Lord are crushed olives releasing a beautiful oil. People that are repentant and broken, surrendered and trusting. Just speak comfort to you right now. Just rest in the presence of the Lord for this moment. We don't know what to do, Lord. Our eyes are on you. Help us to comfort others, Lord, as they're going through it. To not just be well-wishers, but to be intense prayer warriors. Pray for our family, Lord. We pray for one another, everyone that's hurting battling phantom sicknesses, these weird things happening to our bodies. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, God. Thank you for your healing. Thank you for the blood. Thank you, God, for the tears from your eyes and the blood from your side. God, forgive us. for the temptation that we give into, the depression, the anxiety, the fear, the worry, Lord, the doubt, the disbelief, and the lack of trust, God, pleading you to take the cup. Lord, help us, please, God. Please, Lord. May we pray more earnestly with confidence and boldness, not from fear or timidity, but certainty. Jesus knew, you knew, God, where your prayers were going. Make our homes altars of incense, our closets, our pantries. Oh, man. Our cars, our offices, our hearts. Make my heart, Lord, an inner chamber, a storehouse. People that pray, a people that contend, people that burn bright, release a smoke to your throne. Lord, for everyone that's hurting, battling sickness or adversity, from friends, family, hardship and fear, being beat like a drum. I pray for a sound. <sighs> pray for a sound out of you. I pray for a song. Sing, beloved, sing. Sing like you've never sang. without complaining. Forgive us for complaining, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Lord. Forgive us for complaining. In the wilderness, you will lure us out to get our attention. Lord, I thank you for healing our hearts in this house. I thank you that Rock City Church is a mighty force of broken, desperate people, God, please. It's not by might, it's not by power, it's by your spirit, Lord. May we never be afraid to cry or afraid to be broken. Have mercy. Have mercy, God, to everyone listening, wherever you are, whatever you're facing, whatever you're going through, mercy, mercy for generations, merciful to thousands of generations, thousands of generations, Lord, and so faithful, God, so faithful. 
I pray for healing, Lord, supernatural healing, God. Drive out the phantom sicknesses and the pain, the headaches and the back pain, cancer, asthma, diabetes. Lord, heal us and we will be healed. Heal us and we will be healed. Help us to wrestle, Lord. Fight the good fight. Say this, I'm going to fight the good fight fight. of faith. I pray resilient strength into you today. Be resilient, beloved. God's fashioning you into a beautiful diamond, a precious stone, gold and silver. You're being refined by the fire, pressed by the press, crushed by the anvil. Just be, let God do what he does best. Lord, have your way in our lives, Lord. Release your power, God. Please, release your fire. May we be an acceptable sacrifice without strange fire, Lord. Light the fire, God. Light the fire. Light our fire, God. Light our fire, Lord. And I want to thank you, Jesus, for the worst of the worst the most broken. Those pulled from the rubble, the burnt down stones, that from us as a family, you're building something beautiful. Build us, God. Build my life. Build our lives, Lord. Build our lives. <laughs> 